Okay. Unlike the raster data model, in which values are represented more or less raw within each pixel, the vector data model requires kind of a reporting geography, in this case polygons, um, and these polygons represent counties, in order to symbolize any given set of attributes. That is to say, these, these polygons or counties may have multiple, multiple attributes, but we can only symbolize one of them at a time. Um, in QGIS, the default symbology, of course, is just a single symbol. Um, you know, in this case of the example I'm showing you right now, everything's just white, um, but usually it comes in with a simple fill color and a thin black border. Um, I'm showing state boundaries here, but um, what I want you to see is that I'm actually showing it by, by county. I'm just not showing a border with these other symbologies here. Um, but if we want to symbolize quantity, for, exa uh, for example, this is population density, we can use this kind of graduated color scheme um, to show the geographic spread of some type of phenomenon. So in QGIS, you would use a graduated symbology to kind of come up with different schemes like this. So let's check out the diagram. Here we've got a map and the related histogram. And a histogram is just a tool. Um, it's kind of very similar to a bar chart. And it helps us visualize our data set more statistically. The raw number of counties is represented on the y-axis here, and it's in relation to another attribute on the x-axis. In this case, we've got uh, densely populated counties and kind of population density. Uh, right now, you can see that there are a great many counties in the U.S. that have kind of a sparse population, and they're white and this light color here, this lighter yellow. And there are a bunch of counties with moderate densities of population right in here, and they're kind of the salmon and red, light red colors. And there are very few counties that have really high, high density, and they're represented in red. So with visualization, as I'm hoping you can kind of start seeing, is we have this, this other issue. Not only are we trying to report values by polygon, which is the spatial bin that we put our values into, um, but we also have to place colors on a map, and in order to do that, we need to symbolize by classes, um, which are kind of these statistical bins. And how you decide which values go into which bin greatly affects the interpretation of the data on the map. And what colors you choose to paint those classes also greatly affects the interpretation. So let's look at a few of these kind of classification methods. Okay. And like I said, the first one to come in is usually single symbol, which is just uh, one one color for everything in your entire um, in your entire kind of data set, and that isn't really that useful. So if you want to do a, any kind of graduated scheme, you have these kind of um, these other methods. I'm going to start with equal interval because that's the one that seems like it makes the most sense. This would be um, making classes based on, let's say it's uh, 0 to 1,000 people per square mile, 1,000 to 2,000, 2,000 to 3,000, and so on. Um, you know, I'm not sure that those are exactly what these classes would be, but that's the idea is that you're, you're increasing um, your class breaks um, kind of at regular intervals. And you can see that in this case, it doesn't necessarily work that well. Um, if we did that, most of, if we only had five classes and they were all equal, most of our counties would all be pretty much in that first class of, um, you know, not intensely urban. You know, probably this is some suburban areas and then rural areas. Um, so equal intervals good for certain types of, of data, but not in this case. Um, if you can imagine kind of a different data set, let's say, um, number of, um, maybe this is instead of po population density, this is like um, age or something like that, in which the number of people in the age are more kind of homogeneously spread, where you've got a bunch of young people, middle-aged people, and old people. You know, a classification scheme like this might work well in that case because it will put, you know, 0 to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80. Um, there are different types of data sets that that might actually work really well with. Natural breaks. Now, this version um, was kind of developed by this guy named George Jenks. Um, so sometimes it's called Jenks. You might see in different GIS programs that's in either parentheses or just listed as the Jenks method. 
But natural breaks is an algorithm that kind of goes through your histogram or your data set and it says, yeah, well, it kind of looks like there should be a break in the data set there and one there and one there and one there. And it, and it just splits up um, into classes kind of based on this, uh, this algorithm, what, what looks like they should be good spots. In this particular case, um, we're still kind of over-representing this class right here with color, the unpopulated class. Uh, it might be nice to kind of differentiate a little bit more so we get more color on the map. It does an okay job though. It does better than um, equal interval does. We can start to see the area around Seattle. Um, Southern California is getting brighter here too, Miami. Um, still pretty dim up here um, in relation to these other parts of the data set we were kind of seeing like okay well um, most of the country still looks very depopulated um, which most of the country is but we'd, we'd kind of like to see a little bit more variation just so that we can kind of understand what's going on a little better um, so natural breaks is pretty cool it's usually a default for um, classification methods in a lot of different programs so you know just kind of be aware of that one it's not bad the next one is geometric interval. And this is the one we started out on. And I think it does a pretty good job. What's nice is that it's, it kind of shows us um, more of a variation. And of course, geometric means that it's going up um, either kind of doubling or tripling or um, you know by the, by the exponent, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, that kind of thing. So you get this, you get this spread where the class is, it's kind of assuming almost that your data set might have this um, this kind of geometric uh, spread going on. And because we have a geometric spread in our data, of course the geometric interval classification se scheme seems to kind of work the best. And, um, you know, in this case, the whole country looks like, oh, well, you know, there are patches, there are medium-sized cities here. You know, we can kind of start to see Minneapolis, um, greater Chicago area, some of these probably more suburban counties are, are getting highlighted a little more. Um, you know, Miami and again, this stretch along the Eastern seaboard is called the megalopolis here. It goes from Boston kind of down through New York and Philadelphia, right straight to DC. This stretch is a kind of a, a big deal in population geography. It's, um, you know, good to highlight things like that. Now, um, Southern California, of course, it's, it's hard to tell because we, we can't see our county borders, but clearly, um, these are bigger counties, so we'd want to kind of figure out what's going on in there. And what I mean by that, of course, is that um, we're, we're actually probably not looking at population density. We're looking at raw population values. I, I made this, this diagram a few years ago, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what it was. But um, if we were to normalize by area and make it population density instead of raw population, then some of these larger counties would be diminished because um, they have more area. And we'll talk more about that when we get into kind of core pleth mapping um, in future videos. But anyway, the idea is that we're focusing on right now is um, the, the classification method. So the next version is called Quantile. Quantile tries to take an equal number of records and put an equal number of records into each class. So the class break itself on the bottom is not regular or equal, but the number of records in each class is equally represented throughout the colors. So usually quantile will look kind of very, um, you know, very colorful. And in this case, it doesn't really do a great job because um, the tail end of this geometric spread is including, you know, this is probably not even that, that far, not even two standard deviation or one standard deviation away. And it's, it's including all of the outliers and extremes kind of within this this other part of the data set. But even though it's kind of misrepresenting the highest class here, which should be the extreme, um, Quantile is a really useful tool because um, it can help you, if, if you know what your data set histogram looks like, it can help you at least um, tease out some of the differences kind of in the bulk of the data. So um, it's important to to realize that just because you're painting it one way doesn't mean this is how you're going to express it in your final map. Maybe you look at the data in, in quantile form and look for some of the kind of uh, differentiation in the, in the meat of the data set and then decide how you're going to label your extremes and kind of and symbolize those. 
a lot of population geographers will actually use quantile with five classes, and that's actually called a quintile. So if you ever hear somebody saying, oh yeah, well we're going to look at um, the core pleth map in quintiles, that means they're using the quantile method with five classes. Um, so how do you choose? How do you decide? Um, how do you decide which to use? Well, the first thing to do is look at the spread of your data, right? If you have a geometric spread like this, then probably a geometric interval would be good. If you have a homogeneous spread, meaning there's an equal number of classes per variable, then probably equal interval will work well. If you've got kind of a, a Gaussian or quote unquote bell curve shape to your data, then probably a, you know, a standard deviation or kind of a, a divergent scheme would work well. And um, you know, quantile is a nice way to start off sometimes just to see the variation everywhere and then decide, oh, well, we don't want all of Pennsylvania to just look that dense in our final map. Let's make sure we play around with our classes so that our, um, our, you know, our highest class isn't spanning that large of a range. Um, I usually prefer a manual classification method after I look at the quantile, geometric, natural break methods. Um, there's also in Q a standard deviation method and um, I think the geometric interval is something you have to do manually, though this is, uh, this is definitely something people do a lot. So it, it's a blend. You want to you wanna take a little bit of each of these, the idea of each of these, and kind of come up with one manual method that works really well. Um, what I usually do is I look at my, my spread, I look at my, my minimum, my maximum, how various, uh, how, how variable are my extremes. Um, Think of it in terms of um, you want to show variation in the bulk of your data, but then you want to highlight kind of the extremes of your data set. But don't over highlight what you think the extremes are because that's dishonest. And don't under highlight um, the bulk of your data because that is also dishonest. Anyway, this is just an introduction. Um, good luck.